Good morning, everyone. I hope all you're enjoying your morning so far. My name is Avin. I'm an engineering manager at Spotify, where I lead the compute in Hendrix and the platform team. And today, for the next about 10, 15 minutes, I'll be talking about compute strategies for generative AI. Before we begin, I want to give a quick introduction about Hendrix ML Platform. What really is Hendrix? Hendrix is Spotify's internal ML platform created for MLEs, where MLEs can experiment, train, and deploy machine learning models. We support models from smaller models all the way to large models exceeding over 100 billion parameters. Just a quick overview of what Hendrix looks like. At the very foundation layer in Spotify, we have data, compute, and orchestration. These three things are the basic building fundamental blocks that makes a platform. On top of that, we have Hendrix. At the compute layer, we use Kubernetes cluster. On top of that, we run Ray. For model serving, we have Trident and VLLM. Then we have workflows and Hendrix SDK. Uh, the way how a user would interact with Hendrix is that, essentially, if you're in machine learning engineers, you would specify what sort of resources would you need. You would say, hey, I need these many head nodes. I need this much memory, GPU, and so on. And you would essentially write Hendrix compute create cluster command, the one you see at the lower uh, right side. And you would submit that to Hendrix, and Hendrix will provision that for you and uh, spin up the necessary cluster where you can train your large models. Now, for today's discussion, I want to talk about compute strategies. And I'm sure has this happened to you before. You notice that there's a new model that's out, and you want to download it, fine tune this model in your own data set. So you go to Hugging Face, you download the model, and you, fine -tune, you try to fine tune it on your data, but bam, it throws your CUDA out of memory. <laughs> So what do you do next? Maybe you go back and you try reducing batch size all the way down to one. Maybe you use some activation checkpointing, FP16, and by doing all of this stuff, you are noticing that it is actually reducing your overall memory usage, but the entire process is extremely painfully slow. So maybe you go out and get yourself a larger GPU now. Maybe you get yourself H100. So larger GPU, you can use larger batch size. Training is happening much faster. But there's another issue. The cost associated with renting H100 is really, really high. But another issue is that utilization. When you start looking into your utilization metrics for your H100 GPUs, you're noticing that overall it's very, very low. You're barely using about 10 15% on average. And your entire memory utilization is roughly about 20 to 40%. So you've definitely over-provisioned yourself. If you have encountered these scenarios, today I'll be talking about three different strategies, talking in three different layers that will help you overcome them. Uh, to begin with, first I'll talk about infrastructure. So what can you do at the more core infrastructure layer to optimize your infrastructure to get better performance? On top of that, I'll start building on a distributed training layer. What can you do on a distributed training layer in terms of actually training your models faster? And finally, I'll end up talking about memory optimization. What can you do in term, on, top of your memory op, on top of distributed training layer to even save more memory? So the very first infrastructure optimization I want to talk about is high bandwidth. And this essentially is the most foundation that's needed in order to train large language models. So in this diagram that you see over here, each of these pink boxes that you see, you, these are VMs. This could be normal uh, compute engines or AC instances. And within these VMs, you have these gray boxes are GPUs. So in this case, I have V100s. So in this diagram, I have four different VMs, each VMs having eight different V100 GPUs in. What I want to do is that I want to connect each of these V100 GPUs with really high interconnect communication, something like NVLink and NVSwitch. Now, depending on what generation you're using, you can get roughly about 1,000 gigs or even more per second of uh, data transmission. Now, within the workers, this is where it becomes a little bit more harder for you to get as high as NVLink and NVSwitch, but you can typically use something like high interconnect, like InfiniBand, to hook up those workers. By doing so, you are setting up for better speed when it comes to distributed training, and I'll be talking a little bit later that it's going to help you much more. The key also thing to consider here is that the number of GPUs you have in each of your node kind of defines how many ways you can actually split your model later on when you are training your large models. The second infrastructure optimization that you can do that will help you speed things up is faster nickel operation. 
So when you are training these large models, uh, there are a lot of collective operations happening. Fundamentally, under the hood, it's most likely using NVIDIA's Nickel library. And you want to do anything possible to speed that process. If you are on GCP, at Spotify, we do use GCP. Uh, one really quick way to do this is to be using faster uh, Nickel Fast Socket. Nickel Fast Socket is this transport layer plugin on top of GCP that speeds the entire training process. And it's really easy to enable that on your VM. And by doing so, you will get some uh, additional speed. <clears throat> the third intra-optimization is compact placement. Compact placement essentially says that, hey, you can position your VMs closer to each other. So physically, by putting your VMs closer to a common geographic location, will reduce the network latency among the VMs, and this will also help you in terms of speed up your training process. And the fourth infrastructure optimization is model checkpointing. <clears throat> so Training modern LLMs, there are a lot of actually different optimizer states and data that you're storing. And during the entire training process, as you're saving different checkpoints of your model, uh, the data could be from hundreds of gigabytes almost to a terabyte, right? So if saving such a massive data back and forth through disk can be a very time-consuming process. And you want to minimize that as much as possible. And there are a few different things you can do that. Uh, one, something very straightforward, simple, is to spin up an NFS server. In fact, that's how we actually started at Spotify. So if you have your Kubernetes cluster, you can go ahead within that same cluster, spin up an NFS, and you should be able to do it. Uh, the other one is async checkpointing. During the training process, asynchronously, you can, in the background, start saving your checkpoints. That will also help you speed up the process. And finally, if you are on GCP like us, you can use something called GCS Fuse. GCS Fuse is from GCP that allows you to essentially mount your GCS bucket directly to your Kubernetes cluster as if this is your local file system. And this will dramatically help you speed up the process as well. Now, these are the different things you can do on in terms of the distributed uh, infrastructure layer. I just want to talk about distributed training. When talking about distributed training on a very high level, you have data parallelism and model parallelism. And there are different variations of data parallelism and model, vari uh, model parallelism. You have parameter server and all reduce on a data parallelism side, and pipeline parallelism, tensor parallelism, and a few other Im implementation of that in model parallelism. But before going a little bit more deeper into actual distributed training, I want to talk about the anatomy of models memory, right? So when you are training a model, like what's actually happening under the hood in terms of what are different things that's actually occupying your memory there? And if you look into it, there I would say there are four high-level things here that's actually taking your memory in a model training process. These would be your model weights itself. So for example, if you are training your model, and if you're doing this on full precision FP32, Typically, you will be, it will be stored four bytes per parameter just for your model weights. The next thing is optimizer state. So if you're using Atom W, then Atom will be storing another eight bytes because of momentum and variance. So eight bytes times the number of parameters that you have. For gradients, the same thing as a model weight. So again, it's four bytes times the number of parameters that you have. And forward activation depends on a few other factors. But the key thing in this diagram here is that if you have eight billion parameters model, uh, just to train this actual model, it will require roughly about 128 gigabytes without any sort of optimization. And 8 billion itself, if you were just considering the actual model weights, that's only 32 gigs. So the, pro the key here is that you need a lot more memory to train the model than you would typically need just to store the model states or even during the serving process. Now, that's being said, I want to go back to data parallelism, right? So in data parallelism, the idea is that you go ahead, you take your model, and you replicate your model across different GPUs that you have. So in this diagram, I have GPU 0, 1, and 2. So I'm storing all the model parameters, gradients, and weights. And each of the different workers or GPUs will take a certain segments of data. And either they will, they will perform the forward pass, backward pass, and that specific data, exchange the gradients, and communicate that with all the other GPUs. So eventually, all the GPUs will have the same uh, gra uh, gradients and parameters. This works well if you can fit your entire model in a single GPU. But what if you cannot fit your entire model on all the parameters in a single GPU? Now, you have to use model parallelism for that. And the idea behind model parallelism is that if I have three different GPUs over here, I can go ahead and split my model across three different GPUs. So in this diagram here, I have the first layer of the model in GPU 0, second on GPU 1, and third in GPU 2. This is a very naive implementation of pipeline parallelism. There are other approaches to this. And as you're training your model, the data will flow from the first GPU to the last GPU. And during the backward process, it will go back again. Now, you might be wondering that you know, there are different 
implementation of this, right? So if you look into PyTorch uh, documentation for different distributed training strategies they support, they have DDP, PDP, which is pipeline data parallelism, and you also have FSDP, which is a native implementation now of PyTorch of the zero optimizers. What should you be using? And at Spotify, we did various different benchmarks of using DDP, PDP, FSDP in different scenarios. And on a very high level, it really depends on these three variables. And these three variables are your batch size, uh, which is exactly how, what's, a, what's a batch size that you are using to train the model, the actual size of the model itself, and finally, what network or infrastructure are you training this model, right? Are you training this model in a GPU clusters that are connected by InfiniBand and NVLink and NVSwitch, or you do not have any high interconnect in that case? It really depends, limits you in terms of what you really can do during the entire training process. So I want to give a quick um, high-level guideline in terms of what uh, you can do. Uh, this over here, again, you would have to experiment in your own infrastructure. So if you, are, uh, have, if you have a model that's roughly 4 billion parameters or less and, and rel relatively fast network with a large batch size, uh, you should definitely start off by doing distributed data parallelism. It's the easiest way to get things started. Uh, it will, the engineering, uh, in terms of things, you would have to fine tune are much less over here, and this is a good starting point for most people. Uh, 10 billion parameters or less in a slow network and a smaller batch size, typically you would want to use pipeline data parallelism. It will split your entire nickel, your, your all reduce into two different, essentially, clusters or two different rings, so it will speed up the process a little bit over here. And finally, if you have 10 billion parameters or less at that point, it becomes pretty hard to fit this in a single GPU, and you're better off doing FSDP uh, to do this. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about some memory optimization. What can you do on top of uh, you know, distributed training? So we, we talked about the infrastructure layer, which is you know, having a good foundation, fast network, and compact placement, and GCS views, and so on. Uh, distributed training in terms of you know, different types of uh, distributed strategy that you can use. But on top of distributed training as well, what are other things that you can do in terms of saving memory? Uh, one thing that's relatively easy to get started is activation checkpointing. And the idea behind activation checkpointing is that it clears the activation of a certain layers and recalculates them again during the backward pass. Um, again, depending on how you impl how, which one version you use, you could do your recalculate your forward pass during the backward pass process, so you're not waiting for it. Now, this over here is a trade-off. You can certainly use activation checkpointing to reduce your peak memory usage, but the problem here is that it will also lead into lot more training time, because you're recalculating your, 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 your activation again. So this is a trade-off that you're doing in terms of lower memory usage, but also increasing your overall training time. And finally, the last one is optimizing uh, offloading. And this essentially is, if there are certain optimizer states that you are not using, or parameter states, you can essentially offload it from GPU back to uh, CPU. And to do this, you can use zero uh, optimizers. So if you are using FSTP or zero, both uh, stage one, two, and three will support this. Uh, PyTorch has a good config, uh, documentation that explains how to do it. It's literally specifying a configuration file. And by doing so, you will begin offload it back again into uh, CPU. But again, this will also increase your training time because you are kind of spending time in communicating it or reshuffling the data back and forth from GPU back to CPU. Uh, but it will come with having a less uh, peak memory. So this is very quickly, I kind of talked about different kind of you know, strategies, what we've done here at Spotify on a very, very high level. Uh, I'll be here for a couple more hours. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Uh, quick plug, we are hiring at Hendrix, so if you are looking to uh, grow into teams with, with infrastructure and LLM uh, design, then you know, definitely do reach out to me afterwards. I'll be here for a few more hours. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>